So, my mom lives in Antigua now. Although for years she resided in Jersey City, New Jersey, my mother is an incredible woman, loving and nurturing and warm, smart and funny and fit. She was always a runner. Even as we were children, she'd get up at five in the morning and she'd go for a run and come home and get ready for work. And my mother ran for years, even until just a few years ago, and she still kind of does sometimes. She doesn't do it the way she used to because my mother is ill. In 2017, she started saying weird things. Things just, that just didn't make sense to any of us. And she started to become a bit paranoid. We didn't know what was happening. Especially since my mother was living an otherwise wonderful life. My mom worked at the psychiatric hospital in Antigua as a nurse's aide for 38 years, and then finally decided to retire and use her American green card because they were threatening to take it from her because she wasn't living in America. So she decided to retire after 38 years and move to Jersey City. She got a job in an elementary school as a cafeteria lady, and gosh, she loved it. She loved the kids, and she loved the hours, and she started to enjoy her newfound freedom of not having to work eight to 10 hour days in the hospital. And so my mother began to travel. She would travel two, three times a year to Hawaii and, and all over the Caribbean and, and just wherever she wanted to go, she traveled with her best friend, Daisy. One day, I received a call that my mother was in the hospital, was brought into the hospital in New Jersey. So I lived in Windsor, so I flew from the Detroit airport and flew straight into Jersey City. And when I got there, my mom seemed to have had a mental breakdown. So I stayed for a couple weeks and she was released from the hospital and I decided to bring my mom back home with me in Windsor so I could take care of her. And I started to take her across the border to Henry Ford Hospital for treatment. And there, she was diagnosed with early onset dementia. But not just that. Something peculiar accomp accompanied the dementia. My mother had somehow developed schizophrenia. The neurologists at Henry Ford Hospital were stumped, as it is widely known that schizophrenia is a disease of youth. And they asked to do a special study on mom, and we, we gave them permission, and they did an extremely thorough study. They called my grandmother in her 80s, who was back home in Antigua at the time, they spoke with all my mother's siblings. They spoke to all her childhood friends and all of my, my siblings. It's five of us. And they called everyone they could call and talk to them to inquire whether or not my mom had shown signs of schizophrenia before this time. She hadn't. Somehow, the dementia caused some movement in her brain that brought on schizophrenia. They said they had seen it very few times. They even brought a neurologist in from New York who had worked with that case before. But they, they just found it. To them, it was fascinating 
To me, it was like, hey, this is my mother. But my mom was hearing voices, and these voices gave her a new companionship. Some were pleasant and some were fun. And there are a few of those voices that are mean and agitating. And there was one voice that scared her. There's another piece to this. My mother was born with a hearing impediment. And so for the first time in her life, she was hearing voices clearer than she's ever heard voices before. She was hearing voices clearer than she had ever heard her mom and dad's voice, voices, or that of her siblings and friends, or that of her children. And so these voices held full sway of my mother. She's unmedicated, she's living in Antigua, and the voices still do. Holds full sway of my mom. In our scripture today, we are exploring the works of yet another Old Testament prophet, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk's prophecy was addressing a world that seemed to be on the brink of disaster. War was being raged on the kingdom of Judah, and faithful people like Habakkuk were wondering what on earth God was doing. How could God allow this to happen? God had brought his people out of the promised land centuries ago, but it seemed as though the people would never find peace. There was always something threatening the welfare of God's people. And so the prophet was wondering and pleading, God, are you listening? Where are you? As the prophet stood in Jerusalem and pondered the state of his nation, he was sad and confused and frustrated. So much evil was thriving around, completely in the open, seemingly unchecked, but God remained strangely silent. And so the, God, the prophet in our scripture is asking God, what are you doing? What are you up to? Are you listening? We ask that question all the time, don't we? Oh, sometimes with the stuff that we go through, we want to know if God is there. We look around the world now, and to many of us, the world seems unrecognizable. Does it seem that way? Does it feel, does it feel that way? We always talk of hope, and, and it is my job as minister to sell hope, right? But even I, sometimes, I, and I am hopeful, I think things are going to work out. I always do. But even I, at this point, I look around and I think, my God, what is happening? I am here to assure you that even now, when we wonder what is happening, even now, when we ask whether or not God is present, God is listening. God is present in the world. God is still at work in our lives and in the world. God responds to Habakkuk's concern with such 
confidence and flair. God said, look at the nations and watch. And be utterly amazed. For I am doing something in your day that you would not believe. Even if I told you, I am listening. The prophet is doubting the Spirit's presence the way we often do. We often assume that the Spirit is unaware or isn't listening because there is no visual response or tangible or obvious response from God. When we pray, we don't see some magic happen and, and, and what we pray for appear before our eyes. It doesn't work that way. But that's how it works for us. We hold God to the same standards as we do ourselves. We hold God to the same communication standards that we do ourselves. But our communication is so skewed. There's an American educator, Stephen Convey. He makes a powerful statement in this regard of how we communicate with each other. He says, the biggest communication problem is that we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. Our biggest communication problem is that we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. Isn't this true? Yeah. Especially if we're in an, if we're in an argument, right? Oh, we keep our mouths shut, but we can't wait until the person's done talking Boy, so yeah. we could respond. And we didn't listen to a word they said. We just, we listen to one thing they said. We want to rebut it. So we don't listen to anything else. And man, as soon as they're done, we chime in. It's especially so with our spouses, our partners, isn't it? Yeah, I'm guilty. <laughs> <laughs> don't we know it? You know, so I'm taking this statement from Stephen Covey in mind when I say this. When we pray to the Holy One, we don't necessarily receive a reply like we would if we were talking with someone. But what if it's because God isn't listening to respond, but that God is listening to understand. To understand our heartache. To understand our anger. To understand our shame. To understand our illness and the way it has impacted our lives. What if we don't get these sudden re replies from God because God is listening so that God could just understand what's going on? You know, as a minister, I encounter many people who call me in to see them to listen to what's going on in their lives. And 80% of the folks I have done pastoral care with never wanted me to fix anything. The other 20% were looking for advocacy of some kind. But 80% didn't want me to fix anything. They just wanted me to listen to understand what they're going through. And say a little prayer after. The only reply 
the folks require when I look after them in pastoral care? The only reply they want is a yes or no, or oh dear, just to make sure I'm listening to them, to make sure that I'm present, and to make sure that I genuinely care and I'm engaged in what they have to say. 40% of my ministry is listening. You know, when I started my studies, the first year was pastoral care year. And as past of my, part of my studies, they stressed the importance of intentional listening. But honestly, I had already learned how to do intentional listening the hard way. When I started out in ministry, well, when I was in discernment for ministry, Reverend Paul took me around to visit the shut-ins and then I took over doing pastoral care for the folks at Trinity. And I would visit our shut-ins and I could never forget one of our saints named Mary Lou Rowe who resided in Marion Villa. Mary Lou had suffered a stroke and had much difficulty speaking. But she enjoyed it when I came, and she wanted to say so much. She was so excited. She wanted to share stories of her family and her, her great-grandkids. But I often strained to understand Mary Lou, and sometimes I would ask her to repeat herself. But then she would become so frustrated that she had to repeat herself. She had had a stroke. And so sometimes the visit would go sideways. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes the visits would just, I, and I could feel it because she gets frustrated. And then I become, you know, flustered and I feel mad at myself that I, I had to ask her to repeat herself. Oh my goodness, it was painful. So I decided to start to listen to Mary Lou differently so that she would never, ever have to repeat herself to me ever again. And so I started to listen to Mary Lou intentionally using my ears and my eyes and my mind and my heart, I used everything to listen to her. And I was often exhausted when I left there. But it was 100% worth it because our visits became more enjoyable as time went on. As I stand here today as a minister, I can tell you and I tell everyone, it is Mary Lou Rowe who taught me how to listen. The Spirit listens to us with intent and listens so it may understand. And we just don't want to be heard, do we? We want to be understood, right? I think of our current political climate. My gosh. We're not doing a good job listening to each other, are we? We have our own perspective and we cling to our platforms and the people on the other side of our platforms feel misunderstood, feel as though we're not understanding them and we feel as though they're not understanding us. Extremism is bred from this and we can see it. So earlier this year, during that freedom convoy, where the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor was blocked, many people in our community 
was affected greatly by this. Just down the street from our church and some of our parishioners, there is a seniors building residence. And many of them walk to the grocery store for exercise sometimes twice a week. It, it saves them money, but their path to the grocery store is that which was blocked. So many of them had to try to get a ride. I was recruiting rides, drivers from the congregation to go to the building to get names and so we could take them to the grocery store, go all the way around because of the blocking. It was just so disruptive to our community. But it was ten, a 10 minute walk away from me. And so one morning I decided to walk over to the bridge where the protesters were so I can understand their perspective. I didn't get it and I wanted to understand. The group was thrilled to talk with me and to help me to understand. They offered me breakfast. We stood around talking and I listened to them. And it was an interesting conversation, to say the least. But one of the things I noticed immediately was that they were feeding the homeless folks in the area. They were sending each other out. And they were saying, go get your buddies, come. And they were setting up tables and, and feeding the, many of the guys I recognized from the mission. I bet we didn't see that on TV, did we? They were doing some good. Some of the protesters in my conversation with them, and this was my takeaway, some were protesting the vaccine mandates and lockdowns. But when I left there, I thought, wow. Because my impression was that most of them there were about overthrowing the government. Plain and simple. I disagreed with most of what they had to say, but I listened to understand their perspective, and I was respectful. I was respectful, and I listened, even when I was angry at times. And I'll tell you what I was angry about. I was angry because where we were talking, there were some Canadians, but there were a lot of Americans. I was angry because there were Republicans from Michigan who had come across our bridge protesting. And I thought that they had no right interfering in Canada's business. They had no right to be there. And so I was angry, let alone their action to, that's affecting our economy. There were folks in my church who were out of work because of that blockade, and they had just returned to work from COVID. And so I was angry. Um, I thought it was, uh, what's the word? Sedition on the part of our Canadians who were allowing these Michigan people to come over and protest and block our bridge. But even then, I listened and I was respectful. How can we listen to each other even if we disagree? In my mom's world, she has no choice but to listen to the voices with which she disagrees. The ones that come and yell, the ones that tell her unsavory things. She's stuck with them. She has no choice but to listen to them. She doesn't get to turn off those thoughts which are amplifying in her ears 
when she doesn't agree with their narrative. She responds to them, often in agitation, but she has to live with them, as well as living with the voices that who she consider her friends. Most, I, I spent some time going into her mind and talking to her about her friends, and most, she's got a best friend there, who, with whom she talks and laughs and shares things. And most of the voices are pleasant, they're good, and they're friendly. And some are mischievous. And one is scary. My mom, it's, it's not in the sermon, but I think I should give you some hope and a, and a, and a feel-good bit of my mom's life, my mom's story. It is that, so my mother doesn't want to be medicated. She never did. And, um, but she's at home in our small village in the heart of the island. And everyone looks after my mom. All the children, all the bus drivers. She has wandered away sometimes and she was brought back by people in the village. We call her, my family, we say she's a free-range schizophrenic. <laughs> but I'm telling you, my mother is living her best life in her condition. Amen. She is. She, she is mostly happy, but sometimes she becomes agitated. And I'll tell you, my sister, who's the primary caregiver, I would say to my sister, oh, poor mom, or... You know, I'm praying for mom. And my sister says, no, pray for me. She's happy. <laughs> She's happy. Pray for me. <laughs> my mom is doing okay, even as a free-range schizophrenic. You know, the Holy One listens to us all. The sad voices, the angry voices, the frustrated voices, the scared voices, the thankful voices. The spirit listens to understand. And it is through that understanding that the spirit, that God, builds a relationship with us. It's through listening to us and understanding the things we come with that enables that relationship to grow and build. A relationship that helps us to understand when and how the Holy One responds to us. And according to the prophet Habakkuk, when the Holy One responds, it could be so incredible that we would hardly be able to believe our eyes and our ears. And so we pray that it be so for us. Amen.